When I was a kid, gym class was the absolute worst class of the day. And for me, it was bad. For a lot of other kids, it was even worse. All the great natural athletes in the class tended to be the team captains. And the worst thing in the world was when you were standing there, it was two of you left, and you wondered which poor guy was going to be the last one picked. And a lot of times, I was the last one picked. And I didn't like anything they did in gym class. I wasn't very athletic. I really didn't have a lot of background in sports. And the worst day of the year was the day we did the presidential physical fitness test. We would do that, and we did it once a year. We didn't even retest to see if we actually could improve. And nothing happened during the gym class the whole year to make us get better at it. It was pretty much a test to tell you who already had the qualities of doing push-ups, pull-ups, sit-ups, sit and reach, and running the mile. And so I didn't even try. It was pretty bad when your gym teacher is standing there with the clipboard with the stopwatch, and here comes Slade comes by and says, Slade, 11 minutes and 15 seconds. Didn't even look at me to say good, bad, or we'll work on it. So I kind of really got discouraged. And so gym class wasn't something I thrived in playing sports. I wasn't a great natural athlete by any stretch of the imagination. And then all of a sudden, something changed. At age 11, I was diagnosed with diabetes. And it's type 1 diabetes that I had. And my mother started noticing symptoms like drinking excessively, losing weight. I was never overweight to begin with as a kid, but I started losing even more weight for no apparent reason at all. Then it was a trip to the doctor. The doctor says, I suspect he's got diabetes. You're going to have to go in the hospital for a week. They're going to have to determine you have it. And after that, they're going to have to teach you how to deal with it. Well, the whole way home, all I did was hear from my mother, oh, my God, you're going to have to take shots the rest of your life. This is going to happen bad. That's going to happen bad. And they were literally scaring me to death. When I got home, my father laid into me, told me it was basically because of all the Captain Crunch I had eaten as a child, and it was probably causing my blood sugar to go up. So then it was pack everything up, and we're taking a trip to the hospital. So I get in the hospital, and the problem with me was, as hyper as I was, this was going to be an absolute penance. To be stuck in a hospital, not to go anywhere, when I can't sit still for five seconds, was going to be unbelievable. For my parents, it was devastating. They were crying, they were all upset. Friends of theirs were telling them all the bad things that can happen. You know, you have friends say, yeah, my grandfather had it, and this is what happened, and he lost a foot, or he's blind, or all the other kind of things you hear about. It. And the whole way there, they're both crying. And to me, it was just basically an inconvenience. It's like, it's two weeks before Christmas. I don't want to be in the hospital. I want to be out of here. So I'm sitting there saying, how fast can I get out of here? And i got things i got to do. I probably should have taken it a little more seriously, but you're 11 years old, and there's a lot of stuff to do outside. Christmas is coming, food and everything else. Now you're told you're not going to eat. That's pretty, pretty tough. So I get in the hospital, and I have a roommate, and neither one of us wanted to be there. And I think he was probably about as hyper as I am. We get in this hospital room, and of course, to us, it was going to be like, we're going to turn this into basically a sleepover for a week, which was probably the worst thing to do, because... We started doing things like stealing wheelchairs and racing around the hallways until they caught us. We tried to figure we could do it at night because a lot of the staff was gone and only the night nurses were there, so we figured we could get away with it. So we'd race wheelchairs around. He actually hit one of those crash carts, one of the carts that has all the emergency stuff on it, hit it and knocked it over. So I basically figured we're going to be confined to a room and not be able to leave. Then we found syringes. Syringes make great water guns. So we got a bedpan, filled it up with water, stole all these syringes, and made multiple cartridges of one-shot water pistols. So after we finished blasting each other with it, we turn around and turn on the doctors and the nurses. So what happened was we figured out, okay, you have diabetes. Then it was another devastating time for my parents. Me was like, okay, what do I got to do? Then it was another four days to learn how to take care of yourself, which was a whole big thing. My life was about ready to change at age 11 in ways I could never even imagine. And believe it or not, at the time, I couldn't realize it would probably be the best thing that would happen to me in my life. So they say the sooner you can get out and get this all done and take care of this stuff, the sooner you can get out of here. Now, mind you, it's a week before Christmas now. And I didn't want to hear any more stories about it, about how they'll have a Santa Claus come in the, in the hospital and how they'll have a Christmas party and all this. I don't really care what you do. I'm out of here. And so I said, okay, what do I got to do? So they said, the sooner you learn how to take your shots and learn how to regulate yourself, you can go. So they hand me an orange and a syringe and say, we're going to teach you now how to stick yourself with a syringe. Now, just let me do it myself. So instead of going to the orange, I totally bypassed the orange, went right to the leg and stuck it in my thigh. And I was like, this is going to be the rest of my life, but I'm out of this place. So I learned how to do everything. And finally, I said, OK, you can go home. I'm like, yes, I'm out of this place. 
And I said goodbye to my roommate from last time. I never saw him again. I've always wondered for years whatever happened to him. He probably got in as much trouble as I did because he was just about as hyper. And so basically, I was walking away now from my week-long sleepover. And I think I'm not quite so sure whether I was more glad to leave or the hospitals were glad to get rid of us. It was probably a little bit of mutual because they weren't even really a goodbye. It was like, goodbye, don't come back. So I get home, and now my life has totally changed. Before age 11, before that, I basically caught BD and AD. Before diabetes diagnosed and after diabetes diagnosed. Now I'm in the AD. And now all of a sudden my mother's got all these great natural foods to eat, no sodas and everything else, but guess what she's got? She's got Christmas cookies. And there is nobody in the world that likes Christmas cookies like I do. And I'm talking the ones that have the nice little multicolored little things of sugar on top of them. I could eat them forever. And here I'm sitting there saying, I should be looking at more of, there's a lot of long-term complications with diabetes, a lot of things I need to take care of. My main priority was, how do I get Christmas cookies? Because I've been told you're not going to eat them anymore. So I say, okay, there's got to be a way I can do this. So I look at the cookie tin. I said, you know what, if I grab some, and then I take and jumble up all the rest of them in there, it kind of looks like the same amount are in there. So I go in there, I take five Christmas cookies, jumble up the whole tin, and it looks, well, it's a full cookie tin. Think I got away with something. Well, not with my mom. I got away with nothing with my mom. I don't know how you all you had with New York kids, but I'm telling you right now, I got away with nothing. I also thought when I was a kid, I thought my mother had a computer chip that basically told her everything to look out for a kid. So I realized later in life, she was just as bad as I was. And she was just now head, heads and leaps above me, knowing that I was going to do it because that's what she did. So she says, I'm counting the cookies. There's five less in here than there were before. I said, no, no, God, no. And she says, I counted them. And you, cut, you took Christmas cookies. I'm like, great. So now I got caught. So now I'm like, okay, well, guess what? I now can't eat Christmas cookies. I said, but I want them. And I remember in the hospital, they told me, the more active you are, the lower your blood sugar goes. I said, well, there's the key. If I can get my blood sugar down low enough, I can eat. But how do I do that? Because it doesn't make sense to not eat, because that's what I want to do. So I figure, you know what? Now I have a really cool ally. The presidential physical fitness test that I despised and hated my whole youth now became my best friend. We came up with a mutual agreement that we were gonna now work together so I could eat Christmas cookies and anything else I wanted to eat. So I started running. I go outside, I run around the block a couple times, and guess what, my blood sugar came down. And I checked back then was urine, I check it and I show my mom, look, I can eat something. Then I realized, okay, I hated push-ups, but I'm going to start doing them. Got it down even more. I'll start doing sit-ups, and then I also started doing pull-ups. And all the other things that I hated in this test were now helping me get my blood sugar down. So then I realized, you know what? My body's changing. As I did this, I was eating some Christmas cookies, but I was also realizing everything about me was changing. I looked at it, I said, I'm slimming down even more. I'm getting more energy, I can run even further. I'm now becoming addicted to exercise at age 11. And who would have ever thought? I mean, I look back now and I say, my God, how in the heck did I ever discipline myself to exercise, all for the sake of getting Christmas cookies? And you know, I've had people lecture, I listen to lectures about diabetes and things like that, and no one ever talks about the whole thing of diabetes from a view of an 11 year old kid. You have to understand, that was my view. You could have told me all that you're going to prevent this problem, that problem, having a low blood sugar is the best, you can keep your blood sugar under control to prevent complications. An 11-year-old kid's not thinking about, they're thinking about, when can I get my Christmas cookies? When can I get a slice of pizza? When can I still eat some of the things and have some semblance of normalcy that I had pre-diabetes? Pre, pre so then I realized, you know, I kind of like this exercise thing. So I went and got a paint bucket and I filled it with dirt. And I started doing curls. My curls for the girls at age 11. And then I went and bought a weight set at a toy store that was about two miles from our house. I went with my wagon and with long cutting money bought a plastic weight set and brought it home. That's how independent I was. It wasn't my parents going and buying it. It was me now going and buying the weight set on my own. So now I was going from while exercising Christmas cookies to I'm exercising to get jacked. <laughs> I mean, I want, to get, I want to get big. And the final reason I actually started saying I really like exercise, I was in my bathroom one time and I'm putting a shirt on and I go, is that? What's this growth? <laughs> I said, and then I looked at the mirror and I went did this and I said, that's a bicep. I like this stuff. 
And then I found myself, when I'd walk in the bathroom without a shirt on, I kind of give the nonchalant, turn the eyes this way and go like that, like that, hoping nobody saw me do it, because these arms are looking pretty cold. So next thing you know, my body's changed, but then my whole life changed. All of a sudden now, I go in gym class, and the teachers who wouldn't give me the time of day are now talking to me. And now they're telling me to go out for this sport and that sport. And you have a lot of potential here, a lot of potential there. So now I'm becoming the golden child. Then the kids that used to bully me mercilessly when I was younger now leave me alone. And all of a sudden I'm building confidence. It's amazing how when you start getting stronger and you start getting more fit and your arms start getting bigger arms, how much your confidence skyrockets. I was big man on campus now. I was the guy walking around with the arms and everything else and it's really cool when all of a sudden kids are all coming up to you talking about this strong guy, Rob Slade. In fact, it's funny, I actually go by James Robert Slade, that's my full name, and it was, a lot of people didn't really realize that in school when I was called James, because that was my first name, a lot of my friends called me Rob. And then they'd say, God, have you seen this guy, James Slade, he's huge. Why well, don't I know a guy by Rob Slade, he's even bigger. And we're the same person. So it was really cool, and then all of a sudden, I get into school, in high school, and now I'm giving all the privileges of the big man on campus and the jock athlete. In gym class, when they had the units for basketball or volleyball or soccer, my best friend Brian and I are now told we can go in the weight room and work out. And even though it wasn't really fair that I was getting privilege over the other kids, I certainly took advantage of it. And I looked and I said, I am now going to take full advantage of this and work out. And it's funny because I even had a person in my gym class who was actually in trouble and actually um, quit school. And he had drug issues and things like that all through school. And when he came back, he asked me, can you help me get big? I'd really like to work out. And that's when I realized, too, now I'm the big man on campus, but I always remember what it was like to be on the other side. The kid that was bullied, the kid that wasn't cool, the kids that couldn't play any sports. And I took him under my wing, and he started working out with me. And then all the jock kids were kind of like, why are you friending with that guy? He's, he's kind of a loser. I said, he's not a loser. I said, I'm helping him get better. And so I finally then realized it was not only time to be big man on campus, it was time now to look back and give back to the people that didn't have the advantage I had of getting diabetes. So by the time I finished that, I moved on to college. I played college sports. I taught scuba diving and became the first, one of the first instructors in the country with type 1 diabetes to be a scuba instructor. And if you look at the first episode, my whole experience diving, I then began to own a gym. And my mother was funny because my mother, when she was a kid, I tell her, I want to own a gym. She says, no son of mine is owning a gym. I said, well, that's what I want to do. She says, I am not going to have you own a gym. What am I going to tell your relatives you own a gym? You're going to have a responsible job. You're going to become a physical therapist, and that's what you're going to do. And it's kind of funny how that turns out. This is my gym. This is where I come to work each and every day. So when I look right now, and I look back a lot of times, and I say I've lived an incredible life. I've had one of the most adventurous lives you could ever have, sometimes a little bit too adventurous. I played college sports. I still work out now and I still compete at age 64. And I look back and I say, what happened or what would have happened if I hadn't have gotten diabetes? What would have happened if I hadn't have had something that my parents at the time perceived as devastating? And I'm not making light of having diabetes. There are a whole lot of things I got to worry about and have had to worry about for basically this, the past 53 years. And it never leaves you. There's never a minute of the day you don't realize and know you have it, or have to know you have it. But I look back and I say, I may never start started exercising. I may have never had an interest in doing any of this if I hadn't gotten diabetes. And again, it was a pretty devastating diagnosis to my parents. There are a whole lot of worse diagnoses, and there are a whole lot of people that made a whole lot more out of their lives than I did. But what you need to look at is, when you get a bad diagnosis or bad news or whatever, a lot of times it opens up a whole other door for you to go out and achieve something even greater. I became pretty humble. You know, I, I never forgot, unlike the natural great athlete that never had to worry about anything when he was younger, and always without even doing anything, was great at everything they did. I had something bad happen to me. And you start then looking and changing your whole view on that maybe I should not only be looking about raising myself up, but I need to raise everybody else up. And that my experience can help now help a whole lot of people. I've always wondered about that one guy that I got set up on a workout and he's still working out. But I look and I say, I think I'm going to change his life, even if it was a little bit. 
And I look now and I see every day I change kids' lives. I help them inspire themselves to do things and have great things. And I've seen kids that have gone from not being able to do much of anything to now realizing that the human body is this amazing, amazing machine that gets better the harder you work it. And that whatever your situation is now is not where you're stuck. You're not stuck. You work and you get better and you improve. You'll have a great day and I'll see you next week.